good, Mulwini. It's that time on a Sunday morning for you to sit back and relax. I hope you've got that steaming cup of coffee next to you. Forget all about the worries of next week. Just for the next 30 minutes. And let us bring you a, a slice, slice of, of light. This morning, we're coming to you from the tranquil Pearson Conservatory. Built in 1882 at a cost of 3,800 pounds, it's been bringing joy to the people of PE for nearly 140 years. Coming up, the love of Christ in action. We visit the Pennywell Children's Foundation. Then, a refreshing interview with business trainer Alan Glover as he shares his formula on faith and family. Finally, we hit the desk, the sound desk, as we tour Wiki 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 Chiki Rap Studios. Mm. First up, we visited the Penuel Children's Foundation, which offers a fresh start to vulnerable children. So tell us what happens at the Penuel Children's Foundation. We are a temporary place of safety. We take up the six children at one time. Um, and the children are coming from backgrounds of abuse, neglect, um, having been abandoned or orphaned. So um, they're coming from trauma. The reason we exist is to take children from really difficult backgrounds, give them somewhere safe to live, while whatever's causing that background is either sorted or an alternative long-term family can be found for them. A big thing for us is when they arrive here, um, we choose four adjectives to describe the children so that um, we are affirming their identity as children of God, as sons and daughters. We don't see these children as um, less than or um, as a problem or um, unwanted. Uh, we both feel unwanted baby is an oxymoron. It doesn't make sense because every single child is planned and purposed by God himself. Penuel is an unusual name. What does it mean? Um, okay, so Penuel is the place in Genesis 32 where um, God met with Jacob and changed his name from Jacob to Israel. Um, and so it's a place where, where Jacob, it says that he wrestled with the Lord and then um, God um, touched his hip and he had a limp from then on. And so it's this um, picture really of, of Jacob battling with God, but God um, overcoming him with, with love, really, and, and ch changing his identity from Jacob, which means deceiver, into Israel. And he became a source of great blessing then um, to, to the nation of Israel. And so our heart for each child coming into our home here is that the Lord would change their name from orphan or unwanted to um, son and daughter. We're very passionate about that. But how did an Irish couple end up in P.E.? So the day that I gave my life to Jesus, I got a picture of myself surrounded by kids that didn't look like me. I was 15 and up until then my life was focused on music and boys pretty much. And then all of a sudden this was a big change and I realised in the picture the ground was very dry and I realised it was Africa. And all of a sudden I had this heart for Africa, which I'd never had up until then. So it was a big shift, uh, very noticeable to my friends and family. All of a sudden, Kate wants to go to Africa and be around these kids. I knew they were children who didn't have parents in, in the vision that I had. And then, yeah, I was 15. Uh, I thought I was probably going to be a nun because there were no men who were interested in doing this with their life. So, And then I met my amazing husband when I was 24 and we got married as quickly as possible. For me, it was more of a step-by-step -step process. So while I was in university, I was studying community youth work. Um, in Northern Ireland and as part of that I had to do a number of placements. So for one of those placements I was sent to Peter Meritzburg uh, to work as a part of a street team working with children who live on the streets. So during that time we had the privilege of rescuing a child from the streets who'd only been there one night and uh, we had to drive him home. And in that moment I realised that no matter how quickly we rescue these children off the streets, even one night on the streets causes huge damage. And at that point, I realized that early intervention was where my, my heart really was at. Uh, God gave us a vision of a set of glasses, and he clearly told us that each one of us made up uh, the lens. And through by looking at both of our visions, we would get a better um, picture of where we were supposed to go, a more 3D picture. Turning their dream into a reality was not a simple path. It was an eye-opener to realize that what we wanted to do was harder than we thought. 
And when you get given a vision by God, you always sort of think that it's going to be easy and quick. But um, when we started looking after these children and seeing some of the challenging behaviours, we realised that we had a lot to learn before we got there. Eventually, their journey ended in the Eastern Cape, but there were still questions. Okay, so when we moved to um, Port Elizabeth initially, um, people were um, some people were saying, you know, do do you really think we need another baby haven? However, um, there are one million children in South Africa who are um, without parents. Uh, when we first opened our doors, it was March 2014, and it took uh, less than three weeks to fill the haven. It certainly showed us that there are a lot of children who um, fly beneath the radar. You guys must have amazing success stories. Can you share some of them with us? Yeah, there was two children um, that we had in our care. They were both brothers. And uh, when they came into our care, they were very wild. And um, they were covered in marks. And um, we, we had the privilege of getting to see those children flourish. And we prayed for them. And after three days, every single scar was healed and gone. And they changed from being children who ran around our garden screaming and cursing and in many ways manifesting to children who would march around the outside of our gar garden declaring God's love. And there was one time where I walked into the bedroom of the eldest child at, um, it was late at night and he wasn't in bed, he was standing at the window looking out the window and um, I was thinking what's going on here so I asked him why are you looking at the window and he says oh I'm looking at the angel. When I asked the boy in the room what the angel looked like he told me that he was um, tall and um, muscular long hair with a big flaming sword and wings out of his back. Um, and that, that description is one of the things that makes it was really beautiful to me because at no stage was there any race mentioned. He was very much just describing the angel because the angel was there. That is beautiful. Speaking of angels, this whole time, this, throughout this whole interview, you two have been holding each other's hands. What keeps your love going? What sustains your love? For not just for the children, but for each other as well. The thing that we are very aware of is that um, we have a common enemy uh, that that really wants to destroy these children. Um, and so I think having a common enemy has brought us closer together in many ways because we know that we're not fighting against, like even in legal battles that we've had to face, we're not fighting against people. It's not um, the magistrate or the social workers or even sometimes, you know, parents that have abused their kids, we're not fighting against them, we're, we're fighting against the enemy himself. And I think the awareness of that has, has caused us just to really fall in love with each other even more, I think, you know, because we're, we're both on the same team and we know Jesus has called us. We know before we met each other, we knew that. Yeah, I know I love my husband now more than I ever did in the day we got married. And a lot of that is down to seeing you as a man of faith and a man of, of integrity and love and also a father figure. I think a lot of these kids are missing father figures. And so for me to see my husband stepping up into that role, there is nothing hotter than that. It's awesome. I get to be married to this man. It's amazing. We also have put in place a lot of practical things. For A key for a strong marriage is communication listening to each other and having a safe place to do that. So if either one of us is having a hard day, the other person will just put them in the car and drive them to the beach and we'll walk along the beach and have a heart to heart and make sure that we are connecting on a, a deeper level. Also, when you're working with these kids, you see what you fell in love with being pulled out again and again and again. For me, my wife, it was, it was her compassionate heart. And every time we have a new child arrive in, you see it again and it reminds you who they are and why he fell in love with them in the first place and deepens that love. When we come back, Megan gets inspired by the most encouraging man, Ibai. We're back. Just in time for Daily Slice. And this week, I'm with business trainer, Alan Glover. My faith roots go way back, and I often think of my grandfather. He was a local preacher in the Methodist Church for more than 50 years. And as he was getting older, he started to lose his memory a little bit. So one day he actually preached at St. John's. They then sang the final hymn, and then he preached the same sermon all over again because he forgot that he'd preached. And then my father decided to take him out the pulpit. But my father also had a very strong faith, so 
so you're my faith roots uh, go, go way back. I really admired him because when he was 21 years old, he was in the Second World War. For some reason, one day, they took him off his aeroplane and they put him onto another aeroplane. And the aeroplane that he was meant to be on was shot down and they were all killed. So as I say to people, I just made it into this life. So every day I get up, I'm very fortunate that I actually even got to come to planet Earth because I nearly didn't make it. So I suppose my father was always a man of great faith, uh, great courage, very committed to whatever he did. And so I think I learned a lot from him. And also my mother, also, she's an amazing person. She's most probably the closest person to a saint. Talk about your early struggles with learning. I started school at five and a half, so I was quite young. And so in Standard 7, I'll never forget, my brother is a professor of mathematics and I was a bit of a palooka. So the teacher said to me, why are you so stupid compared to your brother at maths? And, you know, that's kind of stuck with me. And, and when I was 23, all I wanted to do was to become a teacher. So I went to the university and they had a look at my track record and they weren't very impressed, so they turned me down. But, you know, in life you must never give up. And so I went to Dr. Jardine. He was a, a doctor of English and he used to be my headmaster. He said, you leave it to me. So he snuck me in the back door and I did my four-year degree. So, yeah, I think I'm still a bit of a plodder. But um, most certainly over the years, I think I've, 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 I've discovered that I'm, I'm sort of smarter than I thought I was. And I just read all the time and I love learning, even at 62. What caused you to move from education into the business world? Financially, it was a struggle. And I think I was just stagnating. I wasn't growing. But because I believed in my heart that I was a teacher, I just thought, no, I can't leave. And everybody said, you can't leave. You're a teacher. You were born to teach. But I think after two years of, of hanging in and feeling like I can't move, I just knew that God had a bigger plan for me. But I just knew that if I wanted to grow, that I would have to leave. And then the, the last 23 years on my own, you know, running my own business and being pretty much a one-man band with the help of my daughter in the mornings, it has been a huge challenge. I've just grown tremendously. And if I'd stayed in teaching, I don't think I would have grown like I have now. But I still miss the teaching environment, to be honest with you. The business world can be quite rough. They say the hardest place to be a Christian is in your own home. Is this true? I think it is because people know you warts and all. You know, people know you exactly how you are. And so I think that's the place where one should be the most pleasant and the most positive and the most kind. But unfortunately, it's not always like that. So if I'm not feeling so good on my way home, I never go straight home. I go to the field and I, I chip a few golf balls or I, I go and talk to the ducks at the dam. And then after that, I go home and as I get to the front door, I say, okay, the people behind this door are the most important people in my life. So, you know, really be nice to them. And when I wrote a book, the book was built around the Greet, Meet and Treat Foundation. So how do you greet people? How do you meet with them? And how do you treat them? You are someone that's exceptional at showing people the love of Christ. How do we achieve that? We've all got our strengths. We've all got our weaknesses. I've got my weaknesses in my life, but, but being loving and kind is always, um, has always been my strong point. So I think also, you know, the Bible says, love your neighbors, you love yourself. And if you don't love yourself first, you can't love other people. And I think the problem is hurting people often hurt other people. I love everybody. I think especially the people that are painful because I realize they must be hurting. So I think, you know, if you want to be able to love other people, the first thing you've got to do is to learn to love yourself, be kind to yourself, encourage yourself, motivate yourself, and then talk nicely to yourself. Alan spends his life inspiring people. What inspires Alan? A guy like Nick Vujicic, I mean, he's got no arms and no legs. When he was 10 years old, he tried to drown himself in the bath because he thought nobody would love him. He decided not to drown himself because he thought his mom and dad would be too sad. And today, you know, he's married to a beautiful lady. They've got two children. He travels the world. And he's such an inspiration because there's a guy with no arms and legs. And he should be sitting at home feeling sorry for himself, but he doesn't. Before we spoke, you told me about an amazing story. Something that happened at a men's breakfast? I was at a men's breakfast one morning. And you know, I wasn't feeling bad about myself, but I just thought, you know, God, how can you use me when I'm not all that I should be? And so at the end, um, I was asked to pray after I did my talk and I was praying and I just felt something special happening as I was praying. And then at the end, a lovely chap in our church called Anthony came up to me and he said to me, you know, when you were praying, something made me open my eyes. And as I looked at you, I couldn't look at you because there was this bright light. It was just shining so bright that I felt like if I kept looking at you, I was going to be blinded. And so I closed my eyes and I looked down again. And then I said, you know, thank you, God, that even though I'm imperfect, 
that you can still use me. And you know, the Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So God can let his light shine through our imperfections, which really is very encouraging. You know, some people, you just feel better. And he's definitely one of them. Coming up, a recording studio with a difference, training a new generation of sound professionals. Colossians 3.23 tells us, Whatever you are doing, do it with all your heart, as if working for the Lord and not for man. Our next guest does exactly that in the most creative field. Bronwyn now runs a recording studio. Here, she trains students in sound engineering. She told Megan her passions were clear from an early age. I've always been interested in music. In fact, it's a bit of a complicated story as to how I got into music, so I'm going to start there. Um, I needed to make a life's choice, and it was a choice between medicine or medics. I was a paramedic and studying to be a paramedic. Um, or music, which has been my passion since I can remember. I started playing piano at uh, the age of four. Um, and I remember it was a Friday night, and I needed an answer for my dad to say, what are you doing with the rest of your life? And uh, I remember kneeling next to my bed on Friday night and saying, Lord, I need an answer. What am I doing with the rest of my life? What is it that you want me to do? And um, I said, I can't miss this because when I commit, I commit. So I said, please, won't you write it on the wall or write it in the sky or just make it really obvious? I can't misinterpret this. And to my disappointment, I went to sleep and there was no thunder, there was no lightning, there was nothing. Everything was quiet. And uh, the next day I was meeting with my dad and um, the time was fast approaching where I needed to sit down and give him the answer to what am I doing with the rest of my life. <laughs> and um, I was waiting in the driveway for him. And as, as I was waiting there, I became aware of five planes that were flo flying overhead. And um, they started to skywrite. Right. And I looked up and the message that was written in the sky for me was music for you. And that was the defining moment for me as to what I was going to be doing with the rest of my life. Bronze career developed from sound engineering herself into training. I'd started with very humble beginnings. Um, I was training people one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I'd moved into a, a classroom. I was renting um, a, a one classroom with no windows from another training company. And um, I just found that the whole reason that I, I wanted to um, do the training side of things and, and become accredited was because when I was in the studio writing music and composing and that sort of thing, um, the people that I was working with, I wanted them to be talented and be able to communicate with me technically as well as creatively. So I was doing a lot of sort of training anyway um, with people one on one and I wanted something a bit more formal. So that is pretty much in essence how, how rap uh, began. Talk about your journey in faith. From when I can remember, um, I've always believed in Jesus. I've been uh, brought up in a Christian household and uh, my mom and dad have both been very faith-based. Um, so I learned to read the Bible and, and uh, I just entered into a natural relationship with Jesus from when I, from when I can first remember and I was baptized when I was 16. Um, and from there, I've just, everything in my life is, is not done without God. He's my everything and uh, my source of direction and source of strength and joy and peace and everything else. Slowly, the training studio grew. It's uh, like the story of the mustard seed where you have um, something really little and, and you plant it and God will give the increase and cause it to grow. He gave me a scripture from uh, John 15 verse 16. He says, I've chosen you that you will bear fruit and that your fruit will remain. Um, and I've seen that where um, the students that we train go, go on. We're looking to input into people's lives 
and to help them to grow, not just on the technical aspects, but also as individuals and as people that will go out and be equipped for what the industry and what life will be bringing to them. Unati has had an interesting journey. She started as a student, but became a lecturer. about that journey. Well, it's really interesting because, I mean, Tlaukkale Obasi student is like a whole other life. And then suddenly, you lecturer uh, and you're having to guide Abantu. Um, it has been a, a tricky transition because, for instance, some of the people that I'm now lecturing used to study with me when I was studying here. So that one has been tricky, but I, I enjoy it. Uh, I'm used to speaking in front of people, but okay, the teaching element, it can be a little tricky. Okay, <laughs> yeah. your favorite part about lecturing? The thing My you love most about lecturing? And the impact you get to have a moment bom to because cloud teacher um it it's not only about what you're teaching them, but it sometimes um spills over into their personal lives. And of man sindokbana umdu you hold a, a bigger place a bomin bake even outside of lecturing. So Jewe to that impact or or and la chance you ba be involved in greater depth other than just being apa or lecturer um, and getting to share information because I believe kausazi into ngaske we transfer kabanya and not keep it to yourself. So yeah, that's that's my favorite part. Student Sasetu shares what she feels is special about the training here. What makes this place special more than anything is the fact that when you walk or drive through the gate, it literally feels like you're home. They always tell you, you did that, let's do it again. Because we know you can do it better, you know. So it's, it's that being given the opportunity to be the best you could possibly be. That's like the best thing ever. We see this company as a ship. <laughs> and every single time we have student intake, uh, we see that we have precious cargo that's uh, come on board. Um, and every single one of them, we, 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 we love them and nurture them. We're very strict, but it's all, it's all done um, from a root of love uh, because we want them to succeed. We want to see them do incredibly well and, and be successful in the industry. So we love our students. Um, they're good, they're bad, they're ugly, their <laughs> strengths, their weaknesses, um, and, and to have an opportunity to just be part of their lives, even for a short space of time, uh, we, we think of it as a great privilege indeed. Is there any stories that come to mind? One of the stories is uh, Sinatembo, who is actually part of your Slice of Light team. Um, he was a student with us and he's done incredibly well and I'm very proud of him because he, he put on the, the value mic for me today and he's been working with you guys behind the scenes um, and he's fruit and evidence of, of our training. I'm incredibly proud of all of our students for what they've achieved and what they will achieve. Coincidentally, Bron wrote the Slice of Light theme tune. Now, if you need inspiration for the week ahead like I do, Nam. go to our page where Alan Glover unpacks the five C's that will change your life. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Five C's? What are those? I'm not telling you. Oh, come on. You'll just have to go check online. Okay. Okay, I will. Yeah, Facebook. Unlock Facebook. <laughs> Bye. Alan Glover.